Thank you, ladies. Well, last week we did some introductory material for the book of Esther. And today, technically, today we're going to start that. Let me turn that off. Um, in Esther chapter 1, uh, hopefully you familiarized yourself with that, uh, that story this week. It's been a while since I had been to the book of Esther. And as I um, went back through it, I wanted to study it a little bit closer. Now that today we have a, well, I guess, headline-breaking news with the assassination attempt of a political figure yesterday, this seems even more appropriate that I have titled uh, these messages with what seem like gossip headlines, because that's what each chapter is. It's like a national scandal or some kind of controversy going on, and uh, today's is National Scandal Queen's Rebellion. Uh, and last week I intended to show you that, uh, I don't know, Daily Mirror front cover of something with Prince Harry and, uh, and Meghan, and uh, it's almost as if as we get to this book, we're looking at these political intrigue and these things that are going on, we're even entering into that time on our own, so as I said last week, there will be a certain overlap between things that we see in the book of Esther and things that we see in the world around us, uh, but we need to start with Esther chapter 1 and just kind of set the scene, uh, maybe talk about some things that we wouldn't know from the text itself, First, uh, Esther, excuse me, Esther chapter 1 verse 1. The story's getting ready to tell. These events took place during the days of Ahasuerus. And I told you I'm going to call him Xerxes because that's much easier for me to say. So when I say Xerxes, this is the same guy, okay? Who ruled 127 provinces from India to Kush. Now, for us, we know where India is, but we're probably not too familiar with Kush. It says, in those days, King Ahasuerus reigned from his royal throne in the fortress at Susa. So what we're talking about here is the Persian Empire who took over from the Babylonians. This is a large empire, so because you played on where Cush is, go ahead and bring that map up for me, Harrison. That orange you see on that map was the size of the Persian Empire. Susa is probably the main capital, but it's so large and so spread out that there are actually four capital cities. And you can go back in history and, and discover all that stuff. Um, at its greatest extent, it included, here's the modern day countries, Iran, Turkey, Iraq, Kuwait, Syria, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, and Lebanon, as far west as Liber Libya, uh, Bulgaria, all much of the Black Sea coastal regions, Armen Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, uh, much of Central Asia, Afghanistan, northern Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Oman, China, and the United Arab Emirates. So this is a massive empire. I want to say the largest in the world at the time. I feel pretty confident about that, but I can't back that one up. Probably if you Google that, you'd be able to find that out. So this is a large territory. That's why they need four capital cities. So keep in mind, remember when we when we contrasted the book of Esther with the book of Ruth? And we'll have female heroines. Ruth is just this little village story that happened with just Naomi and Ruth. We have now entered into a much broader, much bigger empire, and we're going to see how God's hand in that in contrast with another female heroine in contrast with uh, the story of Ruth. So the nation today that we consider Persia kind of eventually became the nation of Iran. So that's the Persian influence and Persian elements and the language still exists in the nation of Iran. So let's continue on with our story. This is how big Xerxes' empire is. It says, He held a feast in the third year of his reign for all his officials and staff the army of Persia and Media, the nobles and the officials from the provinces. He displayed the glorious wealth of his kingdom and the magnificent splendor of his greatness for a total of 180 days. Do the math, six months, right? So uh, does anybody remember, I don't know if they still have it, does anybody remember the World's Fairs that they used to have? I think like in, back in the 80s, it was in Tennessee somewhere. And I can still remember my grandparents went and they brought me back a hat from the World's Fair. And things like that. So I never got to go. But I, I don't know if they still do those, but this is kind of that same idea. When you have an empire that big, it's going to take a long time. Now, the argument that scholars have was, was this just a six-month straight party, or is he doing this just trying to keep in contact with all his people in all different parts as he's traveling in between? But you're getting the sense that he's gathering all these people, and what we're going to see when we get to the very end today is this may be actually a war planning committee. But over the course of six months... Um, they are introduced to the mightiest king in the world at the height of his glory. If there's anything you need, he's got it. 
Anywhere you looked, his wealth and his power are evident. And even the Greeks, um, who hated him more than anybody else, were impressed uh, with all the things that he has going on. Now, the first nine verses here describe the leaders and these actions of Persia and describe these business meetings and party and fancy decorations we'll get to in a moment. Um, one of the scholars says that it took him four years to prepare for this invasion he was about to launch on. We'll say this at the end. Verse 5, let's look at the rest of the decorations that are going. It makes me think that this person has seen this firsthand. At the end of this time, the six months, the king held a week-long banquet in the garden courtyard of the royal palace for all the people from the greatest to the least who were present in the fortress of Susa. White and blue linen hangings were fastened with fine white and purple linen cords to silver rods on marble columns. Gold and silver couches were arranged on a mosaic pavement of red feldspar marble, mother of pearl, and a lot of details there, right? Almost like he's describing the temple, but the author, keep in mind that as we're reading this book, we're reading literature. The author is going somewhere and telling us this. He wants you to see the splendor of this Persian empire. Verse 7, a little bit of a transition here. Drinks were served in an array of gold goblets, each with a different design. Royal wine flowed freely according to the king's bounty. As much as he has, they're going to serve it up. The drinking was according to royal decree. There are no restrictions. Now, normally, the restriction was that when the king took a drink, everybody else took a drink. But now the king is wanting to make sure that they've got plenty, so drink as much as you like, as much as I have. The king had ordered every wine steward in his household to serve whatever each person wanted. Queen Vashti, who's going to come into focus here in a moment, also gave a feast for the women of King Ahasuerus' palace. All these guys, this army staff, presumably had wives and whatever, whoever came along with them, so she's having a whole separate uh, feast somewhere else. Uh, it's most likely this is an open bar situation. Uh, the one thing that we need to note, look, looking forward, a couple things more about the book of Esther that we didn't say last week is that the Hebrew word here for banquet is actually from the Hebrew word for drinking. This is a drinking party is what this is. So while we might think that they're talking about military planning, the drinking is the emphasis of this thing. Uh, the word, That same word occurs 46 times in the Old Testament. 19 of them are in the book of Esther. So when you think about the Persian Empire, you need to think, and this is, this is our, our also historically true, that they knew that they made decisions while they were inebriated. So there's a lot of things that are going to happen in this book, especially as it revolves around the king, that are influenced by alcohol. I also had a note in my notes here one time to maybe say a little word about alcoholism and, and drunk, but I'm going to assume that I know you guys pretty well. I'm going to assume it's just going to go on that beard and unnecessary. Um, but anyway, no other biblical book comes close to the amount of times that Esther talks about this. Uh, they also have, talk about, like I say, about 11 banquets. Verse 10, now the story begins to kick into gear. We've got this setting of what's going on. On the seventh day, when the king was feeling good from the wine, is what my translation says. The other one says uh, the king's, the heart of the king was merry or he was in high spirits. You get what he's talking about there. Uh, Ahasuerus commanded these seven guys, I'm not going to give you their names, the seven eunuchs who personally served him. He orders them to bring Queen Vashti before him with her royal crown. He wanted to show off her beauty to the people and the officials because she was very beautiful. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command that was delivered by his eunuchs. The king became furious and his anger burned within him. Not only is he drunk, now he's angry. And this is where we get our title, the National Rebellion, National Scandal, the Queen's Rebellion. So we need to talk about a couple things here. Why she wouldn't honor this request is unknown. Perhaps she knew it's a bunch of drunk men. My husband's drunk again. I'm not going to go there and dignify this meeting with my presence there. Perhaps she was far more noble than he was and didn't feel that she should lower herself to those expectations. What the actual expectations for her, some suggested that the king wanted her to dance nude in front of the party or whatever, but we don't really know that for a fact. But whatever the expectations were, she was aware of them and said, not going to happen today, King Xerxes. All right? Perhaps she took it as a personal insult. I'm hosting a banquet. How can I come to yours? I'm supposed to be hosting all these wives of all these men. You want me to interrupt and leave my guests to come see you? Perhaps it was just something as simple as that. Perhaps she just realized he's drunk. It's insulting to me. I'm not going. For whatever reason, she must have realized there would be consequences for this. Uh, the point of the story is not that we know the details of the request. There's, it's interesting to note 
not just what the author of the book of Esther tells us, but what they don't tell us. Right? You, you, gotta under, you have to sometimes read each book of the Bible as the literature understanding the author wants us to know this because this is the important part and didn't say this because it's, it's irrelevant. Now, we'd love to know what happened on the back and forth on that because that's the scandal, right? That's the part that often the human side of us says, well, tell me the, tell me the details. What, why did, was he drunk and why did she say no? The author doesn't tell us that because this is just a story to set the plan into motion. So we understand the setting. There's a huge empire. The queen has refused the king, and that's going to get where this author wants to go. And we're going to see God uh, moving uh, these, this empire's chess pieces, an empire even this big, through a set of coincidences, right? Just things that happen, small stories that don't seem to mean anything until we get to the end. Look at verse 13. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the time. The most trusted ones were, again, I'm not going to read you these names. They're irrelevant. He puts them in there just so his, history can verify them. These were the seven officials of Persia and Media who had personal access to the king and occupied the highest positions in the kingdom. Now, as I said, we're going to note the role of government leaders, specifically the king, throughout this book. Clearly, Xerxes is not one to assert his authority or make up his mind easily. He wants to talk to these seven guys. I don't know how much time passed between this offense of the king and, the, and meeting with these men. But even his own queen disrespects him and whether he was drunk or not, you can understand how that can be interpreted as disrespect. <clears throat> but his advisors, who are going to be concerned about the king's image, after all, he has to manage this huge empire, uh, and now he has been refused by a single person within that empire. These guys are, I think these guys who, whose names I did not read to you actually were going to regret having their names reported here as we move through the rest of this story. Verse 15, the king asked, According to the law, what should be done with Queen Vashti since she refused to obey King Ahasuerus' command that was delivered by the eunuchs? Uh, perhaps the offense wasn't something personal between the king and the queen. Maybe it was just viewed as disobedience in general, that if someone in general had disobeyed the king, but because it was the queen, they've got to make a show of this. Uh, and I tend to think that's what happened. But uh, So one of the guys, Mimikan, said in the presence of the king and his officials, Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but all the officials, he's included himself in this now, and the peoples who are in every one of King Ahasuerus' provinces. For the queen's action will become public knowledge to all the women. Remember, they're just, they're just in the other room having their own uh, banquet. Will become public knowledge to all women and cause them to despise their husbands and say King Ahasuerus ordered Queen Vashti, queen Vashti brought before him, but she did not come. He's afraid this thing is going to spread. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before this day is over, verse 18. The noble women of Persia and Media who hear about the Queen's Act will say the same thing to all the king's officials, resulting in more contempt and fury. Now, I personally find that a little hard to believe. I see what you're saying, that the queen has set an example that everybody else might follow, but to make the, the king's marital problems a matter of national conflict and the reason for a law is probably a step or a huge step or a lot of steps too far. And we want to explore that a little bit this morning. Um, we should have no illusions, let's keep in mind as we read this story, that this marriage between King Xerxes and Vashti is like a modern, normal-day marriage, one husband and one wife. It's likely that he had a harem, had a lots of women, and was expected to be obeyed immediately. Uh, but for whatever reason, the king's marital problem is now a national crisis. Now, these men believe that the queen's disrespect is going to be an example for Persian women. Uh, and the key theme of this message is not marriage today, but perhaps a reminder would be helpful. As I thought about this, these guys assuming that the queen's example would be an example for all women of the empire, I was reminded that modeling our marriages based on those in Washington, D.C. or Hollywood is probably not a good way to go with that. The fundamentals of marriage are pronounced in Scripture, begun in the book of Genesis, affirmed in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. And the further that we wander away from one female and one, one male and one female for life, as God ordained in the book of Genesis, the more problems we're going to have. Uh, and that's certainly some of the symptoms of what's going on here for sure. So in the, in the midst of all this, the advisors have a plan. Verse 19, if it meets the king's approval, he should personally issue a royal decree. You've got the power, you've got the authority to get this done. Let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes, 
so that it cannot be revoked. Now that phrase, cannot be revoked, may sound familiar to you because it occurs in the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 6, a couple of occasions. Remember when the king made the, the, the decree that Daniel couldn't pray to anybody but himself? That's where that occurred. And it's the same empire that we're talking about here. Uh, one other thing about this, it says, if it meets the king's approval, maybe your version says, if it, if, it, uh, if it pleases the king, another one of those examples of the book of Esther goes to extremes. That phrase, if it pleases the king, occurs nine times in the Old Testament, seven of them in this book. So alone, one of the key themes of the book of Esther is about the king's pleasure. And we know that this is not a king of Israel, a king that God has ordained. He just happens to be the head of this great empire. So here's the, here's, the, here's the law that they make continuing on in verse 19. Vashti is not to enter King Ahasuerus' presence, and her royal position is to be given to another woman who is more worthy than she. And that's going to introduce foreshadow the next character that we're going to see next week. Verse 20. The decree the king issues will be heard throughout his vast kingdom, so all women will honor their husbands from the greatest to the least. So this is going to happen a bunch of men... Uh, who are advisors to the king, they meet with the king's PR team and decide that the queen should be punished for her failure to, to heed the king's request, for her disobedience. And fearful that it's going to catch on, they want to send a message about how wrong this thing has been, how wrong it is to do what she did. It actually says that they were fearful that their own wives would do the same. This makes you think, what is the state of marriage in the Persian Empire? Well, from what we've seen so far, not that good. But the king is so angered by this and advised by his wise men, he makes a royal decree. Men, have you ever tried that one? Be drunk, be angry at your wife, and make, this is the law of the house. I don't suggest you ever try that. Uh, hopefully you've, it's not crossed your mind, but that's what's going on here. And I have my doubts about whether this is going to achieve the desired results. This is probably going to go over about as well as when the king ordered her to come. Right? So now that you've made a law, you've probably not made the situation better. You've probably made it worse. Verse 22, or 21. The king and his counselors approved the proposal. Hey, that's a good idea. Let's make a law. And he followed Mimi Khan's advice. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, which is going to take months to get. I can't imagine he sent this to the farthest reaches of the empire. Uh, to each province in its own script and to each ethnic group in its own language, that every man should be master of Every man should be master of his own house and speak in the language of his own people. And just, we'll say it in your language so you can be clear about what we're saying here, right? So clearly, Vashti is exiled for, might not even be political reasons, it might be personal reasons. That, you know what, my wife disrespected me last week. If we had a law, that would be a good thing. If we made a national law, that she couldn't talk to me like that or look at me like that or say that to me. Maybe that's what's going on here. I'll tell you, when you get a room full of drunken men, that's probably what could happen. And I can see this. But let's let's apply this this way, that creating national laws to facilitate the obedience or the cooperation of your wife is probably not a good idea. It should not be necessary. Husbands, fearful of their wives, rather than having a discussion and a, comprom and a compromise or a relationship with their spouse, they decide, let's talk the king into signing the law. I don't think this is going to go well. And it might, but it might be considered sound from the state of the empire standpoint, but certainly can't be good for the state of marriages within it. Can you imagine the dialogue when one of the king's advisors goes home now? One of the guys who's responsible for writing this law. The wife says, how was work today? Well, pretty busy actually. Really? Why is that? Probably knowing what has happened today, because it went out everywhere in whatever language. He says, well, you remember that incident with Queen Vashti a few days ago, weeks ago, whatever it was. She says, yes, why? Well, the king signed a new edict, new law on the books. Really? Well, what is it? Knowing what it is. Well, it's not something really that I was in favor of, you know, but it's the king, so we, we got to obey it. It's, it's, you know, some some women might not like it. Really? Well, that's what I'm hearing. I'm I'm sure it's not going to be enforced. 
not really even sure how we're going to interpret it. Who decides? You know, I, I don't even know what the punishment is. But, you know, and she's starting to read between the lines. What is it? Just, just tell me. Well, maybe I should just read it to you. This is what it says. Remember, this is not me. This is from the king. King's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm. All the women will <clears throat> respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. Can you imagine having to tell your wife that at the end of the day if you're responsible for the writing of the law? Now, I don't know if these guys had to sign their names on that, but we have their names in the book, right? We know who these seven guys are. I wonder how that story ended. The author of Esther doesn't tell us. But if you just imagine the internal relationship and the nature of the working of the back and forth when they decided to do this. And really, since we've read the chapter, I kind of wanted to dig into this thought a little bit today about this idea of legislating morality and the will of a king. And so I want to ask, I wanted to begin this, this conclusion by with this question for us today. Do you believe that making God's laws or the laws of Scripture, the laws of our nation, will change the hearts of Think about that for a second. Do you believe that making God's law, the laws of our nation, changes the hearts and behavior of people? Now, there's kind of two aspects to that question. There are many in our country, at least some, who who believe that, or at least they fight as if they do. That if we just had the Ten Commandments as our guidelines, that it would be great in this country, or whatever country. It doesn't have to be this country. Some believe that if we aligned all of our nation's laws with the laws of Scripture, that things would be better. And they might be partially and I don't want to build a straw man argument here, but I want to just throw one thing out to you. Do you know, you can find this very easily, I'll give you one, uh, you'll see in the notes tomorrow, I'll give you uh, one example where this came from, that since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, that abortions have increased. Hopefully you've seen it, it's easily verifiable. Not just, uh, not just the, in the number of abortions has increased, but support for legal abortion has now increased. So let me just give you that's one example of us passing a law that we believe is in correspondence with God's law backfiring. As we know that this one's going to do in the book of Esther. So I would suggest to us this morning that we clearly cannot mandate the heart of God in the hearts of men. I'm not saying we shouldn't fight for good laws and God honoring laws and so forth. I'm just saying don't expect it to have the intended result. What I am saying is that making laws may change behavior, may change behavior temporarily, but that's not the same thing as changing hearts. That's something only God can do. As people said, when you came into conflict or confrontation with the living, powerful God and realized you were a sinner, that was a humbling experience, and you realized that God is calling your heart and changing your heart. It wasn't. It might have been at the at the. the medium of a message or a speaker or something like that, but ultimately it was God who changed your heart. And these Persian women here in the book of Esther may outwardly conform to this law, but I bet you that inwardly they are stewing and they are sending those husbands some dirty looks every time he brings it up. You've probably heard the story of the little boy father who told his little boy to sit down and the kid kept disobeying him. The father kept saying it over and over son, I said, sit down, and the boy would not sit down. Finally, the father went over and took him by the shoulders and placed him in the chair, and he said, I said, sit down, sit there. And the little boy answered, says, I may be sitting down on the inside, on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. Right? And I can identify with that boy's statement. We have all found our place in that nature sometimes, even in, in the face of God's laws, we say, well, I'm conforming to this law, but I'm standing up on the inside. Right? Because that's the human nature. That's the sin part of us that rebels against whatever it is. We see throughout Scripture and through the story of Esther that the hearts of men are far from the heart of God. Yet God has maintained His law and His mercy despite the empire or the laws the nation of Israel was living under. We have all been less than perfect in our relationships and in our marriages. To put it mildly, we've been less than perfect. 
None of us have ever had the power to pass a national law to make our spouse respond the way we wish them to. We have all been less than holy in our relationship to God, which is what is required. Romans says we have all sinned and fall short of His glory. Actually, the word there, the, actually if you literally translate it, and are coming short of the glory of God in the present tense, we are continuing to fall short. Thank God that he is slow to anger and full of mercy. Every time I think about the sin nature in us, I mean, why in the world does God put up with us? Why does he tolerate us? Because he loves us. And how I'm reminded of what's becoming one of my favorite passages about uh, God's character. When God meets with Moses on the mountain in Exodus chapter 34 to give him the Ten Commandments, and he kind of introduces himself. And back when we studied the book of Exodus, I pointed this out to us. It says in Exodus chapter 34, this is on the screen for you as well. Exodus chapter 34 says, The Lord came down in a cloud, stood with him there, Moses, and proclaimed his name, the Lord. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed. This is the part you want to see. This is what God says about himself to humanity. The Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God. Slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. Maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. That's what people say. So thank you for that. That's what he wants us to know about him. He says, yes, you are sinners. Yes, you, you are failing in your marriages, you're in your relationships, and you're failing in your holiness. But I'm compassionate and gracious. I'm slow to anger. And I'm abounding in faithful love and truth. He doesn't say I'm the God of vengeance and wrath and anger and evil. We sang this morning, forever God is faithful. And mercy is mighty, age after age. The same thing God said about himself in Exodus. But here in the book of Esther, whether the cause of Vashti's rebellion was truly disobedience or the drunken unreasonableness of Xerxes' request, the stage is now set for how God is going to act. We mentioned last week that he seems to be noticeably absent in this book. We'll dig into that some more in the coming weeks. History records an interesting fact about that the author of Esther lives out that between uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2, we think that this was a military conference to drum up some support for this war against Greece. History records for us that, that is now at this point in the story that Xerxes went on a military campaign to invade Greece. His arch enemy was wanting vengeance for they had conquered his father years ago. The book of Esther says nothing about Xerxes' invasion of Greece. But history records that he wanted, as I said, he wanted to avenge his father's defeat. So his immense fleet sails and they are defeated by the Greeks. Not in one battle, but in two. And he had to retreat home. Xerxes is going to reappear in our story, so keep this in mind that after embarrassing treatment by his queen, he's now faced humiliating defeat in battle and returns home to choose a queen. This first chapter today has shown us the weakness of the king, the rebellion of a wife, and the naivety of a government. God will overcome all truth. That's what people say. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for this short little chapter, this short little story, fascinating as it is. Help us to realize the rebelliousness in our own hearts. We all come to the foot of the cross as rebels. We've rebelled against your law. We plead for your mercy and grace and forgiveness which you have promised to give to you. We are thankful that you have loved us beyond our rebellion. I pray that if there's some, someone in this room or watching by video this morning that doesn't net, yet know you as the God of grace and forgiveness, that that would happen in the next several moments. Many of us in this room can testify to your greatness. And we say thank you. Thank you for your love and your grace that extends to us. Lord, as we pray this morning, we pray that you would help us to build marriages according to your standards and not those of our culture. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be 
and help us to build not a nation of laws, but a people with hearts after you. Lord, we understand often what Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians, that this is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Lord, help us to live up to that today. As people say, God bless you.